That happens by chance. You have to do randomized control trials to get around it. We have to have standard data, standardized databases. Right now, you can't walk into another scanner that's not mine and give this test, because I don't know what activity on your scanner means. We have to figure this out and be publishing cross-scanner databases. That said, where we're going is we're thinking of using psychophysiology. We're thinking of using neuroimaging. More like a stethoscope, saying why wouldn't you use it, and let's get around those problems, rather than why would you use it. And we're also saying just the basic message that this researcher-clinician communication is so important and critical to our advancement. Given that, lots of other directions we can talk about, like promoting and disseminating this stuff, development, morphological correlates. Please feel free to ask me about this later. Please feel free to know that all this was the product of a committee. And thank you very much. Very nice. That was a terrific presentation and a great way to start this series, and we really appreciate it. And uh, I think it's really exciting from the standpoint of thinking about how we really can bring this to patients and being courageous enough to actually be doing it. Well, a lot of us do talk about it, but haven't attempted to do it. We have time for questions, and I would encourage all of you to uh, give up your, uh, in, to some extent, give up your inhibitions, not completely, <laughs> um, and, uh, and ask away. And, uh, and then after that, we're going to uh, gather outside, and we've got some refreshments. So, start off with my my young my young, my oldest son over here, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so, I have a question: Have you thought about? Um, it's a little bit different, but. Uh, have you thought about a way of standardizing the training of the clinicians? You know, so, so this is... The question is, have we thought about standardizing the training of the clinicians? Or, or how you know that they are actually trained. Yeah. What we do know, the clinicians are well-trained in cognitive therapy. We've done that. Are they well-trained in neuroscience? What they've gotten is a couple of sessions of basically what I've showed you today. And we do that every month for the first 15 minutes is remind them the brain areas we're talking about. But that is not yet training. Um, Mount Sinai in New York has traditionally had a really interesting process by which their therapist residents, their psychiatric residents, get trained in neuroscience. It's not happening everywhere, but there are these models that are published about. Um, and I would love to see that be, you know, and, and that, is, that resident training program in neuroscience is published, and I can get you the citation if you're interested, but I would love to see that be more standard. And I think the more we standardize that, the better we do. Bill Falls Stewart is a really interesting drug re researcher. He researches addiction, and he, randomized his therapists to one clinician in which they weren't trained about neuroscience and one in which they were. And the neuroscience training was saying, this is how drugs affect your mind and may make your patient act out and look like they're inattentive, and et cetera, et cetera. What he found is that the therapists, without tr with training in neuroscience of addiction, had much better outcomes in terms of addiction counseling than the therapists who weren't trained. And with his standardized training, they were much more willing to tolerate a little bit of inattentive behavior by their patients. They understood where their patients were coming from better. Their patients ended up behaving better, and they stayed in treatment longer and got better more. So we've thought about it. We don't have answers yet, but I think you're in exactly the right track. I think, so kind of what I was getting at, too, is more like how you, you said you know they're trained in cognitive therapy. But I just know like how you would know that because like I've oh. been in therapy and different people have emotional availabilities like it's almost like a, you know and so like how like experientially I feel like so much of the benefit of therapy is how you know that connection with their therapist and their emotional availability to absolutely as opposed to I've had therapists that have no emotional availability. So the single best predictor of outcome in therapy in many cases is therapist skill and qualification. This is absolutely true. What we have done is we've taken the approach that before we bring a therapist onto our study, they have to get um, supervision on a full case by our master clinician who would have to sign off that they're good enough. 
Then they get ongoing supervision throughout by the same master clinician. And every week, we do what they call a cognitive therapy rating scale to make sure that their therapy is up to snuff. And any time we're deviating, that means we need a lot more supervision. So we really try and keep pretty good tabs on our therapists. We can't assure that they've gone through all the same training program. Um, and I've talked to the Beck Institute about it. They're perfectly willing to do that. As soon as I get supervision money to have all my therapists go through that, you know, that, that's a good way to go. So I think you're right on there as well. Other in the back. Please. Yeah. Hi. Lynn. Yes, absolutely. Nice to see you. I enjoyed your talk. And Thanks. Oddly, as I was listening to your talk, I started remembering that we just got our request to come up with prelim questions for our clinical students. <laughs> oh, nice. Seeing one of our clinical students is taking prelims. So I, I also noticed that you cited the Hamilton and Abramson study, which reminded me how long I've been thinking about depression. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about old questions in the area of depression for prelim possibilities. And one of them is, is this thing that we call depression really you know, a set of heterogeneous disorders with different underlying processes, potentially different treatments, and so on. And I'm just curious, if I had put that prelim question on your prelim, how would you answer it right now? I mean, is this thing we call depression really different disorders? Yeah, I, I'm... That's a great question. So the question is, is this thing that we nominally call depression maybe many disorders? I'm afraid I would probably fail your prelim because to the best of my ability, I will say we don't know. Um, what I can tell you is little bits. I can tell you that you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is being revamped as we speak and we think that maybe we're gonna have a mixed anxiety depression diagnosis that's different from just a depression diagnosis. Um, maybe that's different. What I can tell you is that I have two groups of depressed patients. It's bimodal, some with very high and some with very low amygdala activity. Are they the same disorder? Given that these people were abused and these people are highly reactive, maybe not, but we don't know. Dirty secret, for any depression measure that we would think of giving with self-report, we would have done a factor analysis, right? We would have had a bunch of questions and seen which factors tend, you know, which items hang together. And I could tell you, here's a factor that represents a depression in general, and here are some things which may vary across brain areas. Nobody that I know has ever taken the top 10 brain areas, like the ones on my profiles, and just done a factor analysis, you know, and said, are there some patient, you know, are there is there one factor that's characterizing some patients, other factor that's characterizing other patients you know, that represent collections of brain areas? What I can tell you 